the, the, is, is the question of connecting what we do to other people's lives somehow. Um, so it's really the question of what can an architect do and where does the social sort of come in? Uh, where do they mix? Where do they intertwine? And I've prepared some, some images from our practice. First, uh, you, see, you see us. I'm, I'm not the only one uh, running around with Kramlabo uh, t-shirts. Um, not today, but we're, we, we were eight. And we work as a group. Uh, in, in different teams together, so some, some social element is definitely built into how, how we operate. Um, for those who like quotes, uh, I like the Lefebvre idea of space as a product of social interaction, which is, for me, it's, it's like, um, you know, it's, it's, it's basically a big no to an understanding of architecture as, as a nice object that we look at and we admire just as an aesthetic piece. But, you know, a, and to understand architecture as this is space making or this is, this is relevant, but um, to basically hand over the, the making of space to the people that actually do something and interact and, and, you know, and live. Not the architect as the creator. And now I'm going to show quickly three chapters uh, that, that we, it's more like strategies that we work with. One is urban activators, which is mobile vehicles that go through the city and do stuff. The second is, uh, um, it's like a, a, a contextual intervention where we work collaboratively with people from an area to try to create a space of appropriation. And the third is an urban strategy where we try to intervene in urban processes to make space for other people to act within. Um, so the urban activators can look like this. It's just a bit of a slideshow. For example, they can be inflatable. They can uh, be very highly mobile. They can go to spaces in the city that you know, usually are not really used for meeting or being together. And what I like about this drawing is that it shows the thin boundary between private space and public space up there. Like on top, you see the inside of the house, and in front, you see the bubble and the, the big dinner setup that we like to have inside. So there's really a very thin boundary between a public space and a private space if we talk about you know, actual physical boundaries. But when we talk about mental boundaries, like how we behave, what we do, what we think is appropriate, there's quite a big difference. And I think this could be an interesting, can be an interesting question to like, use these vehicles to bring out a certain sense of in between the private and the public. So the programming of the bubble uh, started uh, with, with something that is both and very social, which is the big dinner. So this is how it comes, inflates, and it, it sits in various spaces, can, can allow for, I don't know, inhabiting spaces that usually uh, are really unpleasant, as under a motorway. It can also be used in various ways, like a dance hall or a conference center. In, this was actually quite interesting, to put a conference on public art into the public space, so people can interact, like over there, touch it. Uh, so dialogues happen a bit more visible rather than in spaces like this where the public would probably you know, not easily find us. Um, the second is uh, Spaces for Appropriation. This was a project we did in Brussels this year. Also a level of social architecture that can be discussed deeply. The idea of participation in those processes. Um, <coughs> Well, we start showing the end result. This is, this is, a, this is a platform in, 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 this, in this courtyard where you see some parts of it. It was used as a parking ground. Um, it's part of a sort of not so well off area of Brussels. And the idea is that next to it is some kind of evening class school, that this, this car park becomes something like a public space, something like a space for the people of the evening classes to meet and hang out and so on. 
Um, and we propose this platform as a, as a more intimate space of going into the trees and also creating this little cave structure underneath. We also put this uh, stair because the entrance to the to the space is very small to the street, so it's kind of hidden. And the stair sticks out and creates this kind of double dialogue, like you, you have it as a sign, but you also can go up and look down the street, which is fun. This is on the platform, this is at night. Um, we also organized some openings or, you know, opportunities for people to start, come together and use stuff. Um, and we, a strategy that we often use is make small things or design small things that can be made easily where you have a very fast uh, feeling of reward that you can actually create something that is different than an uh, IKEA kit. Um, so here we designed this chair that is just made of a few pieces of wood. Um, yeah, And that is Jordan. Uh, building with safety shoes with with big safety shoes yeah, yeah. <laughs> and glasses and glasses yeah. <laughs> and, and a helmet and, gloves, yeah, and yeah. a refund t-shirt uh, uh, uh. <laughs> but that's on the back <laughs> and uh, i mean the question that we could be discussed here is like how 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 participation works how you get people involved in processes and where it doesn't work um, and the third is the hands on urbanism Tempelhof Airport, which is here shown as a landscape of wonders and desires. Um, as you know, this whole field was an airport and it's closed, and then people start to dream and imagine, especially when the city approaches them and asks, like, what do you really want? So you get a lot of proposals, like the highest house in the world, and so on. Um, but this is a sort of dreamscape that I think that is implied in people's minds. But the question is really like how to how do we bridge this uh, reality, which is a big, open, huge, open field, and this dreamscape. Um, and we are we we work together with uh, Klaus Overmeyer from Studio UC and with uh, Michael Braum and partner urban planners as a team for the city of Berlin to develop this concept. Um, and we identified a time gap between the airport use on one side and the future implementation of the master plan, you know, which has always been there. The master plan has been worked on and reworked a lot. So people spend a lot of thinking that the inside of the field should be green and the outside should, take, should be placed for some buildings. Kind of understandable concept. Um, what we got really interested in is the question, like, if you look at this time gap, what can we do within this time gap between the one news and the other, the distant future? Because we all know that this is not going to happen, like, tomorrow. Um, and we found Jeroen Zaris, who is a planner from Amsterdam, yeah. um, who brought in a workshop, who brought us his concept of the Venetian Bridge. Um, that he said that basically like take some time, for example, five years to create processes on, on site to, to interact with the site, to engage people, to find people with ideas, to find uses, to test out stuff and only then start to concentrate and, and define where the place should really go. So this is an idea which is completely reversed to top-down urbanism where we first define a, a, a theme for an area and then we find the suitable building structures and then we find the architects that can do that and then we find the people who can build it and then we find the people who actually want to live that but the other way around we find the people who want to live the city somehow and try to to get an engagement with them to find a way of how the city should actually be so this is workshopping blah 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 i'm going to make this short i think the argument is pretty clear um, so this for me is an important drawing because on top is the sort of traditional uh, planning and architects way of working, uh, the long term development defined by competitions and, and top down tools uh, and we suggested the public space which is the blue layer as a very important carrier for the, for the development and the activation through use which is the colourful layer with the intention of, you know, through this use, as I explained, creating some kind of 
um, inhabiting the frames that are usually produced as sort of an empty imagery in architects' proposals. And uh, we also proposed, or to, to, to implement this, we proposed the concept of urban pioneers, which is uh, the idea of giving away land to people that want to do something. Um, and uh, the hope with this uh, pioneer process is that you start maybe with like one, two, three, it's like things develop as planned, but then you realize that other things interact, like reality interacts with the process or with the plan, and then things can change, like things can come out, things can die, like your idea didn't work like you wanted, or things can grow in a, in a, in a way that you probably didn't expect. Um, this is the tool to communicate a pioneer process to the people of the, of the Senate's building and planning department. It's very important to have these tools ready. It's like we always like to draw timelines um, and they love plans because plans give them an idea of control. Uh, so we put it in a plan. And now, they, now it looks a little bit like this. Some pieces of land have been given away for uh, urban gardening projects from, the, from different backgrounds, some from the far left, which I think is really an interesting mode of discourse in the city. Uh, we did a cultural project <coughs> last summer called the Große Weltausstellung, bringing 15 pavilions into the site and a lot of artistic Im imaginary work. And uh, people from the green department of, of the city are now implementing this, which is, uh, this is not a visually attractive thing, but it's a participatory building of, of a skate ground also on Tempelhof, which was where people were already found in an earlier dialogue process and it's sort of submerged for two years and now it resurfaces as, as uh, things are on the way, which I think is fantastic. So things are moving and this was the third proposal of, or of a possible way of thinking about a social architecture, creating this kind of frameworks for other people to act within. And, and this is a Ramlabor world, mm. a beautiful city with lots of uh, things inside that we made. So it's a question like, can, can you, can you, uh, you know, where do you have to set your tools to? You know, what can you do with small short-term, small-scale interventions? What can you do when you start to turn the big wheel, like how the city operates? Um, yeah. That would be my questions. I think, well, from, I have the feeling there's new taboos developing after a time of a sort of big uh, openness for playful strategies and, and all kinds of temporary activities. Um, at least in, like, from a Berlin perspective, uh, the, the discourse about who actually controls space and mechanisms that shape space in, for the future has become very, very important. So there is people arguing that any kind of temporary use or interim use or temporary project um, should, be, should not be done, but what should be done is any kind of engagement in political processes that try to push the boundary who's actually controlling land and properties. Because the feeling is that um, you know, the, I think the strategy, or the, the idea behind this kind of 
temp <coughs> temporary activities is that you kind of open up the minds and you kind of inspire people and you try to induce a spirit into the city that things can change. But this is now overlaid with uh, an experience that things don't change so much and, as, and that temporary activities can be removed easily. So they can, they, they get a double reading. On one side, you have this sort of emancipatory or ins inspiration or you know, subversive idea uh, layer. And on the other side, you have this, uh, we're becoming urban decorators uh, to, to support the existing uh, system critique, which I think can be, ins you know, you have to look into every situation, but which can be very relevant. So I think, you know, when it's about pushing boundaries, it's really a question, how can we keep up the spirit of, uh, you know, life is not a misery, and we want our cities to somehow be the be the spaces where this this where like an, an open and and positive approach to life can be lived. But then, how can we do this in a climate where everybody feels like you know we have to become super serious and we have to just like fight uh, or become you know serious poli change to a sort of political mode of only discussing you know what is the what is the role of an urban surface um, as an experienced uh, environment in this context? So I, I really see a boundary there. And what do you do with this boundary? I don't know. I think, I mean, for me, I, I really feel like, uh, you know, I think it's it's very relevant to to have this like political engagement and discussion that this happens in the city. Um, but I also think it's I don't want to give up on on the playfulness, you know, in the way of searching for new ideas, because the political discussion seems to come to yeah to very like ideological and sort of rigid, uninspiring kind of outcomes. Of course, it's important to shift that boundary, but I think it's interesting to question like what can this temp this this on the surface activity still do? But how to relate to, uh, to the, the, this be becoming incorporated in the uh, in city and change and maybe filling the, the time gaps uh, between uh, between now and the, and the next big investment? Yeah. How to relate to that? Because you want to be incorporated, you want to play a role. Uh, so how to prevent that you're uh, becoming a, a tool in, the, in, this, in this bigger financial plan? I mean, first of all, I think to, to think that you're not incorporated, would, I think, is an illusion. Anything, anything any of us does is somehow part of a big, big play. So even if you, know, if you play the opposition, um, it's, it's part of this whole game. Um, so I don't think there is any real outside, you know, this is kind of a, a concept that doesn't work. So the question is more like how can we, you know, what are the tools to shape things? And is, is uh, you know, is the temporary activity, is that a, a, a powerful tool? Or uh, do we have to shift uh, to some other practices or, sh or adopt the practice? And um, as, as boring as this, as this uh, urban concept was in the, in the way it was, you know, or many of the working periods were like really horrible, like you don't see a result, you sit in meetings and discuss, uh, you have another discussion, you have another presentation, it's basically the, the you know, the, the urbanist work is kind of, has a very dry side. For me now, we, we handed this in 2008, and it's still sort of, you know, you, you realize that it has its effects. So I'm, I'm quite interested in, in working on that side. You know, like, I, I, for me, it's mentally, it's a little bit of a plier movement. Like you have the top-down side or the engaging with the urban process, which is trying to create a mentality in the planning world. Um, and you have the short-term illustrations, so to say, to show like what it could be or how it could feel. 
and of course it's it's uh, yeah it's playing with the system. And how do you feel about your, uh, your role in the end? <coughs> if you start uh, long-term processes and you do the beginning and at some point, and if you're successful, it gets adopted. A lot of people come in. Uh, your process is taken over by other parties, by a community, by, uh, and, and you sort of disappear from the process. How do you feel about that? Um, for me, it's, it's, it's really fascinating to see how, you know, how, how sort of, I mean, it's, it's not as, as simple as, as you can say, to say, like, we decided that there's going to be the pioneer fields and then you know, there's a linear line to what there is now. The line is like this. Um, and for me, this is the first case where it's really happening that I think our ideas on an urban scale get somehow this far into the process. Um, I really like people getting engaged in, you know, with, with a similar mindset, uh, getting engaged in doing what they can do to, to realize that. So it's, it's, it's not about if that's your question, not about individual individual authorship, but more about a, a climate or a critical mass or something in the city for people that want to run a city slightly different. And I would, at the moment, I feel it would be nice to be coming back in some part into the process, like after it's been running for a while and Ines Rudolf has been managing the pioneer fields for Tempelhof project and other people have been doing other stuff. Um, could be interesting to sort of re-engage and, and see where a next step could be. That's a very good question. <laughs> uh, I somehow feel that that uh, the, the the first illustration for Tempelhof was really, you know, it was a polemic that we did for a, a typical process of asking for the needs of the users. You know, you like put out this call and you get everything back, uh, completely unfiltered. Um, and I'm more a fan of, of sort of the, to try to create a situation where you can sort of act together rather than doing this ping pong dialogue of like I ask you what you want and then I put it in my drawing or secretly go home and drop it because I don't like your idea, you know, which is what usually happens. Um, yeah. So your your clients are they institutions or private companies? Because we're talking about you were talking about incorp being incorporated or was Hans said being incorporated in a system which is uh, what you said like a political dialogue about who owns the land and uh, who gets to give the permits, etc. Uh, I also think well, is it shouldn't we just go for the uh, to be this part this uh, sort of also spearhead of a, of a corporate society, but then change this society and. Mm. Could be to, to be where the money is. I mean, that's what yeah, I. Yeah, we're, we're totally unexperienced in that. We're always. Uh, oh, I, I, I hope you <laughs> had the answer so I could do this. So. Okay. Uh, no, I mean, all we turn around is public money to answer that. Yeah. Um, really, to ninety-nine percent, uh, they have, have they come from different purses, like planning money or culture money. Uh, and I think, I th I, of course, it's interesting to see, like, how can you engage with the private sector? I, I have no experience, really. Mm -hmm. And Berlin is not a city where, you know, Berlin is a city where you have a lot of administration and government, and you have a very sort of wild field of lobby organizations, but I haven't met characters from, like, you know, from the economic field that engage in the city and and are somehow inspiring to work with somehow. But they might be out there, I'm not sure. Because yeah, if you want to create your own world, 
or what we talked about before, village. Now city, now I saw the world, which is uh, <laughs> even bigger. Than, it, it might be interesting to just start your own project development company as, uh -huh. a, as a total, but also with, uh, with all the... Like get a piece of land, yeah. find a way of... Or, yeah. yeah, you could. And a lot of architects are doing this in the moment in Berlin. Uh, it came from the Baugruppen movement. People who, you know, like share, re, uh, how do you say that, collaborative house building practice or find 10 people who want to live together mm -hmm. and then do a planning process together and then build, which is, was the first step of cutting out an investor as, as someone who has to make uh, some kind of percentage of profit on, on the production of a new building as architecture. And now this is shifting towards a lot of more uh, Genossenschaft, what is that? In English? Co cooperation. <coughs> cooperative. Co I think it's called cooperative. It's basically the idea that everybody puts in a little bit of money mm -hmm. and the, the house is then owned by all the people that share this cooperative. So this is the sort of you know, the sort of project development side that is, that is uh, happening, architects doing that and taking on that role, um, managing the, the dialogue processes. Um, yeah, for buildings. But, uh, for buildings, okay. managing the, the, the finance side, helping the people to find their monies and so on. I was also interested, could you make a city, not a building? I don't know. We should sit down and think about yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> I should. know about your city plan. Yeah, yeah. Where I would you start? I don't know. <laughs> Where would you start with it? A very small city, yeah. Small as you can. Okay. Like, like a micro town. Look, I brought my city. Yeah, no, it's a pocket now. But where would I start? With a uh, with a sign. <laughs> with a sign, yeah. Yellow. I, I haven't got a clue. I, I'm trying to start this in the Winkhorst or in La Cava here near near, near a studio. Yeah. It's, it's completely impossible. Because you get every rules, 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 rules. You can't do this. People have like uh, click claims on the land because in the near future there will be project development so we, we claim this now because we've been here for 20 more years etc. You get bigger parties who use you as an urban decorator mm. instead with all this uh, gentrification uh, also going on, still going on. And it's At one point I thought maybe, maybe I, sh I just should go floating because they can't tell you where to float but they also can tell you where to float so <laughs> you have to go to the ocean. <laughs> might, might be, but then it's like, well, how do, we, do I get my kids to school? So uh -huh. uh, <laughs> I need a water bike, etc., etc. So it's, uh, yeah, we need to, <coughs> huh? It's becoming a city. What? A water bike, yeah. <laughs> yeah, small airplanes, maybe helicopters, but then it becomes like utopia, and then you started this slideshow with bye bye utopia. So. No, but it's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to leave the Hague. So that, that's my problem. I don't want to leave the Hague. I want to yeah. have like my own city in the center of the Hague. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So but Christiania uh, would be a model, you know, a, a yeah. sort of off-limits area somehow with a different rule set. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Could you produce that with with private money? Could you just say, well, we. Yeah, you need a piece we of build land. A land. We buy some piece of land and we set up our own rules. It's not public land, so hmm. buildings can yeah. collapse. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> you can't let the people enter the land. Huh? Yeah. People are You can't let normal people enter. Well, normal we only people. accept crazy people. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's <laughs> are you normal? <laughs> no? Okay. Yes. Yeah, or you have these guys who live on the oil. The oil platforms, which is they have in England, I think there's one who's king of his own oil yeah, yeah, yeah. platform. Yeah, there's money and there's this radio station. Yeah, but See then that. again, that's, it's really far away. Mm. So you can do it anywhere where two countries have a border with each other. Oh yeah, and they have from have from where no government has any rights, and that's where you can start these kind of projects, basically. Hmm. Where the border does this? No man's exactly. land. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. No, you, you Split can lift the fence it in half. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah, open the bridge. So you live, in, in, you live yeah. inside the wall, sort of, of the countries, inside this thin divide, what you yeah. showed us, in the, but then in houses and then through countries. That's good. 
So we, we're becoming borderline architects now. Border surfaces. Border inhabitants. Inhabitators. 